Hey everyone, Ed Klima here with the First Responder Center. Today we have Frank Lido, captain with the FDMY and deputy director of their counseling service units. Uh, Frank was kind enough to take a few minutes out of his time. Obviously things are really hectic up there to share some of the things that um, they've been seeing up there, not necessarily from a response perspective, but um, from their members and their family and, and how they're taking care of them. So. Um, Frank, thanks again for joining us. Uh, glad you and your family are doing well. Um, so just want to kind of open up with, um, you know, certainly FDMY has been great about sharing how they're doing some things tactically, but what are some of the things your unit and the department's doing to, to help the members? Well, thanks, and uh, we appreciate being on and uh, appreciate the First Responder Center uh, the excellence and the information that they're putting out nationwide. Uh, it's been helpful to all members, with helpful to the FDMY. Um, so, uh, you know, this uh, from really early on, uh, we recognize that it would, would not only be a uh, health crisis, but it would be a mental health crisis for the members, uh, the members, uh, their families, and really the the community at large. Um, we also recognize early on that. It was, you know, happening in full force here. That, but that would be spreading across the country. Hopefully, not at the intensity that we see here in New York. Um, so, what we what we did early with our program, our, our counseling program, is we, we moved face to face meetings would would be something that we couldn't do. So we moved all our um, our counseling to remote uh, access. And with the relaxing of the rules uh, around um, telehealth, we were able to have all the counseling uh, that was being done uh, to be done by telehealth uh, on some of the platforms that would no, were, were not allowed before this crisis. Uh, so, um, you know, just the regular cell phone interactions, which has been terrific because members have been able to use counseling um, in times where they normally wouldn't, so on their way to work, uh, uh, you know, at home uh, when when they've had when you have a minute. Uh, so th that's been really helpful as far as our peer response. Again, we're not responding um, to uh, to uh, firehouses or EMS stations, but we're having our peers call uh, each firehouse and each EMS station every day and check in on the members, um, recognizing any hot spots that are occurring. Uh, identifying people that are having a real difficult time and, and and reaching out to them directly, so we've been able to do uh, we've been able to do that. Um, we've you know life goes on here. We had uh, two third alarms a couple of nights ago. Uh, a couple of members that were injured. Um, you know some of them you know had some pretty serious injuries. So again, we were able to, we our peer response is done remotely, but I think is being appreciated by the members. Well, that's great. I think you bring up a good point that certainly the the response to EMS calls related to the virus um, have skyrocketed, but you're still, you know, running fires and doing those things and and um, trying to to support them from afar. Um, so it's great you're able to do that in some capacity. What are, what are some of the um, secondary effects you're starting to see from from employees and the members? Um, you know, whether it's been the change of shift schedule or or working more or worry about bringing this home to the family? What are some of the secondary things, particular from a behavioral health perspective, you're starting to see? Yeah, well, everything that you mentioned, N plus. I mean, the, the, uh, some of the unintended consequences of this are, are really surprising me. Uh, you know, today has been a wave of, um, you know, my, my, my mom, my dad are in the hospital, they're dying. Um, they're giving last rights. We're doing it remotely. I have to work tonight. Or I have to work tomorrow. You know, how, what do I do here? Um, so they're, we're now seeing a lot of members, family members, are sick in the hospital, um, and uh, they're wondering, you know, you know, how they go about their their you know their shift uh, when you know, it's likely that their parent will die uh, during that time. So. Um, we've seen that uh, this the right from the right from the get go. One of the issues were people that had compromised uh, members that had compromised family members at home. 
um, young children that had were leukemia or cystic fibrosis or a wife that was uh, or a husband that was going under cancer treatment and they were afraid to, to come home, uh, you know, with good cause, afraid to come home. So um, we were scrambling at first, but the department has been able to secure hotel rooms throughout the city saying, um, you know, really sorry that you're going through this. I'm really sorry your family's going through it, but it's really important if you're healthy um, that you work and you can stay in a hotel room until this crisis is over. So that 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 has been great. Um, I, I think this morning I looked at the, the IMT report uh, and we have 2,200 members that are out on medical leave, uh, mostly uh, with the symptoms of, of the virus. Um, we have 15,000 employees, so it's a percentage of, 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 the, uh, of the workforce. But I also looked at it and 700 members have come back, um, gotten sick and have come back. Come back. So, um, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, they're dusting themselves off after uh, three days without symptoms and getting back to work. Um, which is, you know, fantastic um, because, uh, you know, now they, um, they're still, we're still practicing with social distancing and making sure we have our PPEs, but they've been through it already. Um, uh, I don't know what the science says uh, about them uh, recontract, uh, con con you know, getting it again, but um, that may be uh, unlikely when they get in the end. You, you mentioned uh, last week when we were talking about how this is really, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, I think that, I think FDNY first kind of brought this to light way back on January 17th. So it's certainly been going on for some time. Um, you guys have some resources that a lot of departments don't. Um, some of the stuff that, that your unit, some of the stuff that's Jason's done with organizational resilience. Um, talk a little bit about how having all that place in advance has really helped you guys be able to, to uh, respond to this from, from that perspective. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think as firefighters, as EMTs, we used to, you know, going head on into a, an incident and um, mitigating that incident and 15 and 20 minutes later getting back on the trucks or back on the ambulance and then we get back to the station and it, you know it, it's it's over um that's what we usually do um and you know sometimes you have a drawn out um operation you know, that may last uh, you know a few hours or a day um you know 9 11 lasted years uh and 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 you, you you know you have to and it's hard but you have to pace yourself um, you, you can't go all out all the time, uh, which is which we're not comfortable doing. We're comfortable going all out. That's what we do. Um, but you can't. And and, and I recognize that on 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy and some of the other incidents that I've been at, um, that if you do that, and, and I started doing it here, and I, and I started with my staff here and our staff here, is okay let's you know all out and then i said whoa wait a minute uh this is this is a marathon this is this is a long term this is going to this is going to last for months and we have to we have to be able to deliver deliver for months um so i would say to everyone out there um when when the wave does come you know to really think about um pacing yourself because if you become exhausted or you're non-functional you'll be helped to no one um for the members in the field for people that are supporting those members in the field um you know just take it as slow as you can um give yourself a break uh, i went for a walk yesterday with you know I, I came home went for a walk yesterday with the dog i mean it, it's it's not life as usual but you have if you don't take care of yourself you're, you're it's 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 not going to be a pretty picture that's uh, good advice what what are um you know in addition to that obviously other departments across the country you know here in the northeast we're kind of the first wave as you will um and as it as it goes across the country you know what are what are some you know before we um before we conclude what are what are some other pieces of advice you may have for for other departments that are going to be facing this and to your point hopefully not to the same degree but it'll probably be facing this in the next couple of weeks 
Well, I, for, first is to make sure that your family is okay. Um, make sure that you have a plan for childcare. Um, you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I fall into that stereotype uh, firefighter that my wife is a nurse. Uh, she's been called into action. Um, you know, and I've been called into action more than you know that our, our work schedules increased. Uh, uh, we don't have any children, uh, which is you know the kid, our kids are on their own. But for families that do, you know, think about a, a contingency plan um, uh, for you know taking care of uh, of your your children, your elderly parents, um, and be prepared in in, in that way. Um, you know. Take care of the members. Um, if you're a union leader or administrator or, or a firefighter or a line firefighter, um, you know, do what you can to take care of each other. Uh, this is, um, you know, you, you may have less uh, obligations than your brother or sister firefighter. Do what you can to assist them. Um, if it's, you know, going to get groceries for their grandmother or whatever, you know, ask each other. Um, you know, what are you doing today? How can I help you if, if you have some spare time? Um, and, you know, just you know, what we recognize is checking in on people. Uh, we, we were going to call each station, speak to the officer, or whoever answered the phone, and say, how are things going? We thought that call would be a couple of minute call. And it turns out that call, if it, it can be 15, 20 minutes, because the person on the other end just really needs to talk. Um, uh, our, our members are going to, um, I was listening to the scanner over the last couple of days, we're, we're going to, and, and I, I don't know um, the reason for this, and I'm sure it will come out, but the engine companies are, are going to two and three CPR calls a day, every engine company in the city. Um, and um, I think it's a combination of the EMS being stretched so much that they're not going on those calls. Uh, people not going to the hospital that normally would uh, for other illnesses, and of course, COVID. Uh, so you know, you you know, you not only have the stress of um, of what's going on with your family, you have the stress of these calls where you're you're dealing with death and, and serious illness all day long, and then also the stress of, of are you going to contract this disease yourself? Um, you know, it, it's it really is overwhelming, but like we always do, um, you know, the members of the FDMY, the members of emergency ser services all around the country, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, and, um, but it's, it's not easy. Oh, good advice. Well, thanks again for taking a few minutes to get together uh, with us and share that with the rest of the fire service and, um, you know, continue to stay well and, and best wishes to you, your family, and, and the entire FDMY. Well, thank you, Ed, and, you know, thank you very much for, for having me on, uh, and thank you for the work that you are doing and, and the FRC is doing.